right, hello. So it's a pleasure today to uh, share the stage with Pete Flint. Pete is a rare class of entrepreneur. He has built multiple billion dollar companies, so that's a pretty rare atmosphere he's in. He did it first with the travel website lastminute.com where he's a founding executive. Um, and then that company was sold to Travelocity in 2005 for over $1 billion. Um, then he co-founded with CEO of Trulia, uh, a real estate marketplace. Trulia was sold to Zillow in 2015 for $3.5 billion. And I have to note that his co-founder at Trulia was a Finn named Sami Inkinen. So he's got some Finnish cred here today. Uh, and uh, now he's, uh, with two partners, he's founded a VC firm called NFX that hopes to bring something new to the venture world, dare I say, something disruptive to the venture world. And, and of course, they will fund many more billion dollar companies so he can add to his billion dollar list at some point, I hope. So wow, what, you have quite a resume, Pete. Uh, what a pleasure to have you here. So tell me a little bit about the start of your career. How did you get going in this world of uh, entrepreneurship? So, uh, so thank you, Mika. Great to be here. Um, so, so I guess my kind of, you know, my career started. I, you know, uh, during undergrad, like many people, I took a bunch of internships to figure out like where I was going to go. And I took a, a job at J.P. Morgan, which was basically the most high-paying job I could get as a student intern. And uh, and this was the summer of 1995. And I, I learned two things. One, I learned was like I didn't want to work for a corporation, or certainly not an investment bank at that time. But two, it was the time the internet started. So this was 1995, Netscape went public. This was really the dawn of the, the kind of internet revolution. So I knew from that I wanted to get involved in internet startups. And then I kind of, uh, I, I joined um, Brent soon after I graduated, joined Brent Hoberman and Martha Lane Fox, who founded lastminute.com. And I think the sort of, the kind of lesson from, from my experience at that point was really about how do you find the fast moving water? Or how do you find the momentum? At that time, the internet was exploding. This was kind of 95 to 97. The internet was exploding. And putting yourself at the center of that, that was like a huge lesson for me that helped upon my career. And then in addition to that, surrounding yourself and, and really following, I was like early 20s, so following kind of these incredible people, Brent and Martha, who've gone on to do incredible things to put myself in that ecosystem. Yeah, you were pretty fortunate. I know Brent and Martha. That was quite a, quite a ride for you guys. And uh, so then you went from being in the UK, running a travel website, yeah. to running a real estate website in San Francisco. How, how, did, how did that happen? So the, you know, being in London was incredible. The startup ecosystem is incredible. But I, like, you sort of feel you're doing good stuff. But moving to Silicon Valley and and you know, going to Stanford, I ended up doing a, an MBA at Stanford, was just an incredible opportunity. So to move over to Silicon Valley, where really the, the kind of network is incredibly powerful, all these iconic companies are founded. So I went there to do an MBA. Um, and then the summer between the first and the second year, I kind of stumbled across the real estate industry. So I was sort of had this expectation that in Silicon Valley, everything was kind of digitized, amazing, transformational, you could really do it, do anything. But the real estate industry, for anyone that spent time in America, is in sort of incredibly traditional so, uh, and, and antiquated. So I was sort of astounded at this industry. Um, and then I sort of conceived of this idea to, to, um, to start Trulia, to really cons empower the consumers yeah. with information. Um, so started really as a sort of, um, while we were students at Stanford. And Sammy was a, a good friend and like um, fellow um, entre entrepreneurially minded individual, and then and, and we just bounced ideas across while we were at business school. So, so you're both foreigners starting a U.S. real estate company. I think if people don't know this, I live in Silicon Valley. I was born in Finland. Uh, I'm, I also started my companies in the U.S. I'm an immig immigrant. Over half the companies in Silicon Valley are started by immigrants, uh, and so I think you and Sami is a case in point. That there you are, yeah. uh, a Brit and a Finn starting a company in Silicon Valley in basically a U.S. real estate-centric business. So I th yeah, I think they were just like, what on earth are you guys doing? I think they were like, the real estate industry was kind of afraid of the internet, but they were certainly not afraid of two young, like Europeans who were like doing some crazy stuff in real estate. I have to ask. So a Finn was he the quietest guy in the meetings, or what was it like having a Finn as a as a co-founder? Well, I, well, you know, yeah, you know, Sammy is not he's not a quiet quiet guy. I think. 
you know, it, I mean, it was like a, a incredible partnership. It continues today. We're, we're partners on many different things. Um, you was know, there a sauna in the office? There was no, there was no, <laughs> no sauna in the office. But I, coming here, I do appreciate his enthusiasm for it. You know, he's, you know, I, I was just in the sort of taxi coming here this morning and like, you know, where I was amazed to see these kind of like fins running at like seven o'clock in the morning in the snow. And Sammy used to do that frequently. We'd have like, you know, offsite in Tahoe and Sammy would wake up at six o'clock and run in the snow. <laughs> so now I kind of, I see where he gets it from. So let's go back to you being a founder. So do you feel you, because you had this experience already at last minute where you were part of a founding team, you saw it go through, it's, it's kind of a early stages of growth and everything else, but now you actually were a founder. How did you actually change as a, an executive, as a leader at Trulia? Because now you're in the seat actually of running that company. Yeah. Did you feel you actually grew and changed and, and, and in what way did that, that happen? So, uh, I mean, I, you know, I benefited enormously from kind of shadowing, like in my early 20s, shadowing kind of Brent and Martha and kind of learning from all the good stuff and some of the mistakes that we made. Um, you know, I think the sort of, and there's, you know, a whole, it was a 10-year journey, so a whole kind of catalog of different ideas. I think some of the kind of founding lessons for me were as, as, as sort of transitioning from a founder to, to founding a company and not just being a founder but also being a CEO is really that, you know, there's multiple transition points throughout the journey. So one was like, you know, moving from the sort of head of product to head of the company. So early on, you're just in a small team, you're the product manager. I was the product manager. And then moving from being head of product to head of company and really stepping out of that kind of individual contributor role into that leadership role and figuring out how to focus on all the functional areas from sales to marketing and everything else. And then, you know, like the, the you know, where at the acquisition, we were 1,100 people. And so, you know, every, you know, I think this, you know, as I kind of break it down, there's like the zero to 40 is one sort of company. The kind of 40 to like 150 is a different type of company, 150 to 500 and so on. So, like, there, we had to like, as soon as we kind of hit a sort of a normal say, we had to change it up again. So constantly changing up, constantly changing the management team, constantly changing the org design. And, you know, I think some of the, you know, some of the kind of things that I found particularly hard, I think, as a, as a first-time CEO, was kind of making those transitions from figuring out how do you, the right person who's perfect to be a VP at a 40-person startup is not the right person to be a VP at a 400-person startup. Right. Is there any particular thing that you would change looking back? Uh, <laughs> a million things. <laughs> you know, there's like a the million things. I think the... Um, you know, we had our own set of like crazy crisis. So like you imagine a real estate company in 2008, you know, the people, people remember what happened in the real estate industry in 2008, the real estate collapse precipitated, the financial collapse. And so it was just this incredible time. Yeah. So, um, so we were just in the eye of the storm. We had like investors on one side, Sequoia, one of our investors, and they were like saying, fire everyone, get profitable. This is kind of the end of the world. And then the other, the experience from last minute was this sort of notion that actually companies are built in a downturn. This was an incredible opportunity. So we saw how in 2001 to 2003, that was when the sort of dominant travel companies, Expedia, Priceline, last minute, were created. And so similarly, we saw that opportunity. You know, I, I think sort of relative to kind of Expedia, uh, sorry, relative to Zillow, um, we were undercapitalized. We raised 33 million. They raised like 90 million by the time they went public. And so like this kind of figuring out the financing sort of angle would have been, you know, would have been better. If we raised more money, that would have been better. But that's a kind of, that's a hard thing to change. I like this idea that companies are built during the hard times, whether it be hard times economically, like you said, 2001, 2004 or 2008. Yeah. Uh, that's a very, uh, I think, astute kind of observation. You have to have the cash to weather it or at least have some way to get through that plan. I think that's very interesting. What about the differences between building a company in Europe compared to building a company in the U.S.? Did you see a lot of differences in terms of the culture yeah. of the startup or the kind of a atmosphere or the attitude? Well, I think the uh, things have changed a lot. So, I, you know, I was in, last time I was in Europe, operating was in 2003. So things have changed a lot. I think what is, what some of the changes that, that kind of I experienced was, it's, it was really hard to scale across Europe. So like at lastminute.com, like setting up different offices, setting a different infrastructure. Whereas in the US, you just immediately have 250 million people that you can access 
like very, very quickly. So that scaling process in the US was incredibly easier, it, much, much easier. The, the talent has got so much better today in Europe. They're reading the Atomico report last night, it's like the talent is really created the next generation of companies, but in, there's no substitute for Silicon Valley. I, you know, I remember you know, for, for, Trulia, for Trulia, when we went public, we just said, oh, here's, here's 10 CFOs that can take the company public. Here's 10 general counsels that can take the company public. And we kind of immediately could tap into that talent pool. That's kind of lacking in, in Europe, mm -hmm. particularly in just one concentrated area. Um, so those are, you know, the, I think things have got a lot better in Europe, but it still just lacks that kind of network effect that Silicon Valley, the sort of density of right. people and capital, and then that efficiency to scale. So now you are moving on from being actually a founder, you're a founder of a, a fund, but you still work with a lot of founders. I know you do a lot of uh, advising and, and working with a lot of founders. I'm curious, like when you meet a founder, do you have kind of like standard advice you give them or do you give them kind of tips like, like from, from, the, from the experience you've had or do you have, do, do you tailor for them? I'm just curious, like what's, when you meet a founder, what's the first thing you say to them? If you have a first thing. Um, you know, I, I think there's, I mean, there's no sort of golden rule, obviously. I think some of the stuff that kind of I'm sort of particularly focused on is like, is one is like, you know, we assume you have a great product, a breakthrough product and you're searching for product market fit. Um, but how are you going to grow? What is the growth strategy? Like, is, is kind of, I, you know, my role at last minute was in growth, I truly really focus on growth. So finding whether you're in a sort of a SMB company, how do you get your first thousand customers? If you're a consumer business, how do you get the first million users? Just finding what is that momentum? What is that tactic? How do you build that into the product? So thinking really critically about, about growth mm -hmm. and building that into the product at the very outset. And that's something we really focus on at NFX. Another piece is the culture. It's like, this is a long journey. Like, last minute, truly, they, you know, 10 years, truly, it took. So building that culture and that persistence from a founder, it's, it's critical. And, and then culture is something that just doesn't happen. You have to program that culture. So programming the culture and being very authentic and being very deliberate about that. And then three is like, what is the defensibility? So um, network effects is kind of our main focus on defensibility. And we've seen that, you know, that through the history of the internet, the last 30 years, network effects have been the driving force of defensibility and returns within technology. So we really look at how, when, if you have a good product that's growing fast and a great culture, how are you defensible? And building network effects into that is super critical. So growth, culture, Defensibility, those exactly. are the three things. Exactly. Great. Uh, what about when you meet a founder and they're stressed out? What would you say to a founder who's stressed out? <laughs> Which um, they inevitably are, and they're probably stressed out every day, all day, but is, what's what, any kind of advice to a founder who's just, just not having a good time right now? Uh, yeah, really <laughs> stressed out. Although, you know, when you ask them, how's it going? It's awesome. <laughs> um, crushing it's it. Also crushing it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think what, um, you know, I, 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 in many respects, I, you know, going through the experience with Sammy and Truly was incredibly sort of powerful experience as a founder. And I think some of the stuff that we really focused on was sort of authenticity and transparency between each other. So, you know, I think your sort of natural tendency, perhaps as Finns and Brits, is to like, is to kind of like, don't share your challenges. Like, no one wants to hear about your problems in England. You know, like, don't grumble, don't stop that complaining. Whereas I think, you know, the in, uh, you know, we, we built a culture which was really based on transparency and, and authenticity, which, you know, rather than bottling up the stress, kind of communicate the challenges, communicate the opportunity, kind of, you know, I think you, you need to balance kind of vulnerability with, um, with transparency and sort of being authentic, saying this is really hard. Like, we need everyone to rally around and figure this out. So, kind of, I learned to kind of stop that kind of Northern European. Yeah internalizing stress and kind of become a bit more Northern Californian and kind of open, open that out and sharing that. Let's talk about NFX. So if NFX stands for network effects, by the yep. way, it took me a little while to figure that one out, even <laughs> though <laughs> I know the business pretty well. Uh, uh, so it's, it's a, a Brit, an Israeli, and is James an American? American, yeah. So uh, three, uh, uh, two immigrants and an American founding a VC fund in Silicon Valley. Yep. Tell, just on the top level, tell me about NFX a little bit. Yeah, so kind of firstly, I just feel, 
incredibly fortunate to work with James and Gigi. So they are amazing founders, investors, advisors. So Gigi's um, seen as the number one angel investor in, in Israel. Incredible kind of connectivity. He's founded a number of companies, invested in more than 100 companies. Um, and he's just a force of nature. Similarly, James has just founded a number of companies, super successful, and just is this um, sort of behind the scenes growth startup expert that advises many, many, many unicorns. Um, so we brought together this team of sort of very experienced entrepreneurs to help to invest in what hopefully is the next set of unicorns, focus at the seed stage. Some of the stuff that we think is kind of different, exceptional, is that we've, we sort of look at the venture process and think it's incredibly antiquated. Like, um, you've raised money, we've raised money. It's just like, there must be a better way. And it's a very sort of medieval, backward process. So, so what we've done is the majority of our team today are software engineers. So we have like half a dozen software engineers that are building tools for entrepreneurs. We think the next great venture capital firms will have a significant soft proprietary software component. So we're building that into the fund to help ourselves to, to be better investors, to help our portfolio, the guild, the community, and to help to build the, the broader ecosystem. So we're focused on that. We're focused on early stage. We just closed a $150 million fund. We're uh, focus on network effect businesses network and have playbox to help Any us. industry? Is it consumer? Any, just network, network effect is a key thing. That's in your name, so it has to yeah. be there. So, yeah. we're not, so we're not focused on particular industries. We're focused, you know, we've got a breadth of different experience. So um, we are particularly excited about kind of emerging technologies, whether that's AI, whether that's blockchain, whether that's smart cities, um, CRISPR, a whole bunch of different, different industries. We're based in San Francisco, so we like to be close to the companies in San Francisco to help them to grow and develop. And we think this kind of thesis around network effects plus, a, plus the background that we bring is very unique and very compelling. So there are probably at least a handful or, I don't know, maybe a thousand companies here maybe want to talk to you. So how do they get in touch with you? So the best way to get in touch, we built, actually built a tool to help founders meet with uh, uh, investors called Signal. So signal.nfx.com. Um, and that's, the best, that's, a web, that's the address, the email address? That's the, well, that's signal.nfx.com is a tool which okay. any founder can use to, to really connect with almost any investor. Um, the best way is to use that to connect with us because that helps you find warm introductions to investors. So go in there. Sign, signal.nfx.com. Got it. Yeah. So that's a way to get in touch through Great. a warm introduction. Well, thank you, Pete. Good luck thank with you. the new fun. Great. Pleasure to talk to you. Great to be here. Thank you. Okay, thank you.